Ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to transition to uh, another insect. Ken had asked me to speak about cutworms. Uh, a little introduction, I'm Jeremy Hummel. I teach at Lethbridge College in their agriculture program. And the last number of years I've been working on a study trying to get better uh, management tools or uh, recommendation tools for growers and agronomists with regard to cutworm. And so what I wanted to focus on today was a little update of what we've seen this season as far as cutworms goes, kind of a review of the last couple of years to compare what this season is looking like to the last few seasons. Uh, and then I wanted to go through just a few different ways of looking for cutworms that kind of focus on different species because what we've been finding is not every cutworm species uh, is found as easily with exactly the same methods. Uh, there are different things we might need to do to actually find the bug that's knocking off the plants. So very briefly, what cutworm does is it's a stand reducer early in the season when the plants are small enough to actually be clipped off. Uh, the little caterpillar which lives down in the soil, most of them come up to the soil surface and they just clip the plant off and it basically then just looks like something's come and split the root off from the plant. The plant lays on the soil surface, dries up, blows away, and if we dig in the row, we can find the remaining cut-off stem uh, if we're digging early enough after that damage has been done. So we might have a reasonable stand, we might have an excellent stand, and in some cases we're coming back just a few days later and that stand is gone. It really depends on how synchronized the cutworm's biology is. And uh, that's the first thing that I want to emphasize with cutworms. Uh, in the last few years, we've, I've seen a number of growers who will give their agronomist and call, a call after the agronomist's been there the previous week, and they're just hopping mad at the guy uh, because you scouted the field last week, you said I had a great stand, you said nothing about cutworm, and I went out there and there's a huge patch that's just gone. Uh, and the message that I want to give with regard to that is if the cutworm moths came into the field, laid their eggs all at the same time, if that whole population is synchronized, then all of their behaviors are synchronized and we can get very quick damage happening. Cutworm caterpillars in the soil go through several instars, meaning they feed for a while and then they molt their skin so basically they have more room to grow. If that whole population is synchronized, molting all at the same time, there's a couple day window there where they're not feeding, they're just molting. Um, and so when they finish that molt, then they've got extra space to grow, they're really hungry because they haven't eaten for a few days and they can really get going on those plants. Usually where I've seen that issue arise is in fields where we have quite a bit of especially perennial or winter annual weeds. So those have been established before the crops really gotten established. Those have really been what the cutworms have been feeding on. Then the cutworms go into this several day molt. The crop at that point is growing pretty well. You're doing those, stand, those early stand assessments. You spray out the weeds and then the cutworms are hungry, but the only thing that's really left is the crop, and that's when we see that damage show up. Um, so I guess one of the messages is that growers don't need to be so hot on the phone, getting mad, if they understand that the biology sometimes lends itself to very, very quick damage. So early in the season, we really have to be conscientiously looking for cutworm damage in the field. Um, as far as what we've been seeing this year, we have seen some crop losses, some need to reseed, certainly need to spray. The areas where we've been seeing that is kind of a area, Fort McLeod down to Cardston, kind of looping towards Warner, uh, tapering off as far as what I've uh, heard about towards Warner, but certainly that Fort McLeod, Cardston, and then kind of swinging a little bit east. We've seen some damage east of Lethbridge, kind of towards and past Coaldale and towards Tabor, and some damage that I've heard about secondhand 
in uh, the county of Lethbridge, northwest of Lethbridge. Uh, a number of guys have sprayed there. And then some fields that have been sprayed up in sort of the Vulcan area as well. So really distributed again throughout uh, southern Alberta. And I get secondhand reports of fields that have been sprayed beyond that as well. Um, so kind of a widespread problem. However, not as many reports as in the previous two years. And when I go out to the field, not as many cutworms as the previous two years. So it looks like we're in that sort of tapering off period uh, that we get with cutworm infestations where we have a couple of really bad years and then it kind of tapers off. It's a very cyclical pest. The species we've been seeing this year are dingy cutworm, which is a little bit earlier. We kind of get two waves of cutworms, one that's in the earlier part of the spring, kind of early May into mid-May, um, and then one that's a little bit later uh, which we get late May into June. And dingy is one of those slightly earlier cutworm species. Uh, we've seen a number of fields where producers have sprayed for that. At this point, those dingy cutworm are big and they're not really doing a lot of feeding anymore. Uh, so even though we might be able to find them, uh, their impact has already been seen in the crop. And as far as that dingy cutworm goes, what we'll see at this point is, and I haven't seen any cutworm damage here, so we're gonna to have to imagine that what we're seeing here is cutworms. But what we're gonna see is these lengths of row, a foot, two feet, uh, several feet, where there just isn't any plant growth happening there, no crop growing. Uh, usually we'll see several of those sort of skips, if you will, in a row and in adjacent rows because the cutworm moth does come deposit a number of eggs in an area, so we usually have sort of an aggregation of, uh, of damage. For that dingy cutworm, what I've seen a number of growers do this um, season is they'll say, well, I've got these skips, I'm pretty sure there's cutworm there. Having a hard time finding the actual worm though, uh, because usually what we're doing with cutworm is that we're going along that crop row, kind of digging up the soil and hoping to find the worm in there. With this dingy cutworm at this point, they're not really interested in the plant because their feeding is tapering off. And instead where we're seeing them is they've moved into uh, the area between rows. And just taking a step back here, what we're seeing right now with the dingy cutworm is if we just take the residue that's sitting on top of these uh, inter-row spaces and we just pull that back, right on top of the moist soil is where the dingy cutworms are sitting right now. Uh, they're just under that residue. The residue sort of insulates the moisture down enough so that there's moisture for them. Uh, and relatively soon here, um, they're going to be finished feeding and moving into sort of preparing for pupation uh, just underneath that crop residue. We had a very early infestation the first week or so of May. Uh, several fields in the Lethbridge area just wiped out by army cutworm. We did not see that species this year and a number of agronomists have asked me why haven't we seen army cutworm given that we had so many last year. Army cutworm moths when it gets to the hot part of the summer, they don't like our prairie heat. And so they fly off to the foothills and the mountains and they hang out where it's a bit cooler until the cooler fall temperatures come. And then they fly back out to the prairies. Something that's migrating like that, that has a brain as simple as an insect, isn't necessarily coming to the exact place where it was raised. It's not as smart as, I don't know, birds and things like that that do that kind of migration. So they've flown out somewhere in the prairies, but uh, obviously not to the Lethbridge area where they were last year. Good question. Part of the research project I've been working on is to try to determine why do we get infestations in some fields. Uh, in some cases, we've had a field completely wiped out and the field right next to it, even the same crop, next to no cutworms. Uh, so we see cutworms in canola, in peas, in cereals. Uh, somebody told me just a little bit ago uh, that somebody sprayed a faba bean field for cutworm damage. We see them in sunflowers. 
they can affect any crop. And uh, what we're looking at now is, that, is whether there's something to do with soil type, soil texture, maybe previous crop. So do they prefer a certain type of crop residue? Do they prefer a certain type of soil management practice to deposit their eggs? And uh, we haven't really put the data together to be able to say anything concrete about that. Uh, at least in the Vulcan area, it seems to be pretty consistent that we are seeing cutworms in canola that seeded into pea stubble, but not really seeing a lot of that elsewhere. Um, at least, yeah, not getting as consistent a reports of that. Those, the ones that we've seen so far are dingy in that condition, yeah. Uh, which are again that earlier, one of those earlier species. Um, so at this point we've kind of transitioned away from the earlier species to the later species. And even though Ken told us that we are kind of on track for heat units and such, it does seem like things are a little bit delayed as far as the cutworms go from previous years, from the previous two years because the number of fields that I was at last week, uh, our redback cutworms are still quite small. We're looking at redback cutworms anywhere from a centimeter, uh, or I guess uh, sort of less than a half an inch, a third of an inch, up to an inch long, two centimeters long. And they've got some room to grow yet. So the redback cutworms, which are one of our later species, are still actively feeding in the fields. So especially if we have some of those later seeded fields, we really still want to be watching for cutworm uh, because two years ago, we didn't really last year see a lot of redback cutworm problems, but two years ago, our most significant crop losses due to cutworm were due to redback cutworm. So we still are within that window where we need to be watching for that species. Um, redback cutworm, it will also move a little bit off of the crop row, but what I've seen in the last number of years is that it does tend to kind of stick around the crop row. So as we're digging within one of those skips, if we don't find it right in the row, then just sort of disturbing the soil a couple inches off the actual row will usually turn up the cutworm uh, if it's a cutworm issue. So the dingies seem to take off, uh, the redbacks seem to stay around a little bit more. Um, Yes, yeah, the fields again where we've seen the worst redback problems two years ago were uh, they had perennial and winter annual broadleaf weeds in them. Uh, so that probably drew in the moths to lay the eggs and that's a big probably we still need to put all of that information together. Um, one other thing that I was able to point out to a grower who was having problems finding any cutworms this year even though we could clearly see wilted plants, we could clearly see the little stubs of plants sticking out, uh, was it kind of depends on what your crop row, uh, the soil is like, as to whether that cutworm is going to stick around there. And what I mean by that is this. This particular grower had about, um, if we're being generous, a half inch of sort of soft soil within that crop row. So the crop can easily go down into the harder soil, but the cutworm doesn't really want to put out the extra effort to dig into the harder soil. So as the warm temperatures a couple weeks ago and the drier um, daytimes were kind of warming up and drying out that seed row, that crop row, they couldn't move down to moister soil, so they were all moving out into the deeper we can just dig that up with our hand into that deeper moist soil beside the crop rows. So again, you have to be aware of what your conditions are. If you're looking for cutworms in the middle of the day, chances are they've moved off to where that soil is moist uh, and cool because they don't like hot, dry soil. Um, they're kind of wet, succulent things. Um, yeah, we'll sometimes see aggregations of seagulls and other birds in fields um, where we've got cutworm. So that can be an early indicator or an indicator that maybe you need to be out there having another look. I think that's all I wanted to say unless you folks have questions. 
Okay, then one final pitch for this research project. This is our last field year for it. Um, so if you come across any kind of a cutworm infestation, uh, even a few cutworms in the field, let me know. I can give Ken my contact information and he'll post it to the Farming Smarter website. I'm sure he will listen to me. Um, so let me know if you've got cutworms or if you know of cutworms in the field. My job essentially in the summer is to go out to those fields and collect the cutworms, then to rear them out, take a whole lot of photographs of them, take all of this information about field conditions um, so that the amount of effort you need to put into gathering that is minimized. I take all the effort of collecting and doing that sort of thing, but I need to hear about it first in order to go and do that work. And uh, then next year, the plan is to put together practical resources for agronomists and growers, uh, including identification, including how do we scout for different species, because they do behave differently, uh, including uh, there are other researchers working on management strategies, and there may actually be relatively simple crop management or soil management strategies that reduce the risk of cut cutworm outbreak. Um, and that's going to be put together next year uh, in the fourth year of this project. So that's the pitch. Let me know. Thanks. So if you find any, any cutworms, you should spray them. Oh, no. Uh, the question is, if we find any cutworms, we should spray? Absolutely not. Um, if we're getting patches where there's a whole lot of loss, and if those cutworms are small, so indicating that they're going to keep feeding, uh, then, you know, be thinking about spraying, be thinking about uh, looking at uh, economic thresholds. Uh, the thresholds I've seen are anywhere, depending on crop and area and cutworm species, anywhere from two to five cutworms per square meter. Uh, and just to give you an indication of how heavy cutworm infestations can be, two years ago, one of those redback cutworm fields, I was getting 22 per square foot which ends up being about 220 per square meter. There was no green plant matter left. They were actually ripping each other open because the only green plant matter was inside them. Um, so th they're wicked, wicked beasts. But no, that's a good question. Uh, pardon me? You spray them at night, correct? Yes, yeah, they come up above the soil at night, yes. Some of the species don't come up above the soil. So in uh, the only fields where I've seen big glassy cutworm outbreaks uh, was two years ago, a producer who had corn on cereal stubble. Glassy cutworm is a grass specialist. It doesn't like broadleafs. And so it came into that um, cereal stubble and then the corn crop was affected by that. But it's one of the species that don't come above the ground to feed. It feeds a quarter of an inch below ground um, so you're going to have to have a different kind of chemical for that one, a systemic that um, will actually impact the worm that doesn't come up to contact the, uh, the chemical.